Funding for What You Do Matters is made possible by the Chicago Community Trust. Our future lies in our commitment to each other in practicing goodwill toward all people. At the Chicago Community Trust, we have the privilege to witness the power of kindness and generosity every day. The stories you are about to experience reaffirm our faith in the pure and genuine spirit that is Chicago. Together, we can make our region even stronger, safer, and better, because what you do matters. find philanthropy as awareness, awareness of what's needed around you. I think of it as simply helping others. Time, treasure, talent, right? Um, it's a little bit of everything. It's the participation uh, in democratic life. It's, it's being a part of the human condition. When I think of philanthropy, I think of duty and mission. For me, philanthropy is more than just writing a check. Someone doing something out of the kindness of their heart without expecting to receive any comp kind of compensation for it, you know? Philanthropy, it's the care for the world in which we live. Basically giving back to others. It's really giving in any kind of way. If you are not uh, giving back, then you haven't really completed yourself in my in my opinion. I think that we just have to change the way we think of philanthropy. A lot of us think that if we don't have money then we can't do our part, but it's not about money. It's about helping each other be better people, be in better situations, and that is philanthropy to me. I do believe what I do matters and makes a difference. Everything you do or anybody does affects somebody in some way. Everybody. Everything that we do can have impact. I think that what we don't do also matters uh, in a negative way. I know that what I do, actually I know that what we do matters. What we do matters more than ever. I think it's a very meaningful thing to make the world better and to do what you can. Uh, and you don't have to do everything, but you have to do something. I'm from the south suburbs of Chicago. I was raised by a single mother. My whole life she kind of instilled in me the, the golden rule of treat others the, the way that you want to be treated. After I graduated from Indiana University, a friend of mine got a job in California and needed a roommate and I figured when else am I going to kind of get a chance to, to move out to California started working doing IT recruiting out there in the in the Bay Area. Worked with a, a woman who actually ended up being the best friend of my now wife. We started dating and moved back to Chicago and started our family here. My daughter Isla was born in September and I just fell in love immediately uh, and I just wanted to every single day make sure that she was able to get the most perfect life possible. On New Year's Eve, my daughter was about three months old at the time uh, and I was watching her play on the ground and decided I have to do something for my New Year's resolution to make the world a better place around her and set a, a positive example for her. And I just looked up and told my wife, I'm going to do a different act of kindness every single day of the year next year. It was a leap year, so rather than it being 365 acts of kindness, it was going to be 366 acts of kindness. I decided to start a blog as well, and the reason why I wanted to start the blog was one, so my friends and family could, could follow along with me, but the, the biggest reason is I wanted something that Isla could go back and read herself one day. 
first one was we had just received a gift card for free groceries and we decided to give it to a homeless person near the grocery store. Um, and then I just started writing things down and thinking about what I can do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it was free, whether it was making a donation, whether it was just doing something crazy like giving free hugs. I think the, the one that really stands out the most out of all the acts is the, the day I spent as a homeless person. I sat on Michigan Avenue around the holidays and pretended to be homeless uh, and held up a sign that said, even small acts of kindness have a big impact or, or something along those lines. The reason it had such a big impact on me is the emotions that I went through of how happy I would be when somebody would smile at me or, or give me a nickel, it was, it was incredible. And I just started thinking of, of people going through this every single day. When I first started, my goal was going to be for every follower of the, the Facebook page, the blog, the Twitter account, was I was going to either donate a dollar or a quarter at the end of the year to a, a charity or something, um, thinking it would be a couple of hundred dollars. My friends and family would follow along and stay up to date with everything that I was doing. I quickly had to change when it, it kind of took off like wildfire. I had to switch it to a dime because there were tens of thousands of people that were actually following, not just here in Chicago, but across the country and I found out across the, the world. I kind of put out the call on the, the Facebook page for people to help me out with an act of kindness. And it, the act of kindness was to sing the world a song together. Uh, and so I had a response from every continent of people wanting to sing a song with me. So each person recorded themselves singing All You Need Is Love by the Beatles. The very last act of kindness was actually going to be the, the dime per follower that I said I was going to donate to charity. We were actually going to put that money towards adopting a, a child. My wife had agreed to, to do it and, and allow me to use that for the 366th act. So um, the first couple of months of 2013, we were planning and, and looking up how we do it, where we were going to adopt from, and then we found out that she was actually pregnant with my, uh, my future son. We found out at the 20-week ultrasound that there was a heart defect. They suggested, based on this heart defect, that we do some genetic testing because it was associated with a, a number of different genetic disorders. And so um, we found out it was a, it was a couple of weeks wait that uh, that my son Cohen actually has a, something called 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome. 22Q, for, for short, is actually the second most common genetic disorder behind Down syndrome. We were actually saddened at, at, at first by it and, and wondered how, how this was going to impact our day-to-day -day life and, and his day-to-day -day life, but um, rather than just get bogged down by the diagnosis and, and, and continue to be scared by it, we decided to use the platform that, that was created by 366 Random Acts of Kindness uh, and, and raise awareness for 22Q since I hadn't heard of it and none of my friends or family had ever heard of it. So that's what kind of led to creating State of Kind. State of Kind is a mission to do an act of kindness in all 50 states to raise awareness for 22Q. The biggest thing that I hope comes from State of Kind is more awareness for 22Q. Um, in the future, when Cohen's my age, hopefully there's enough money being funneled into it that it can make anybody who is diagnosed with it have as close to, to normal life as possible. Three hundred sixty-six random acts. What I hope comes of, of that is just 
people will continue to, to find it and, and see it and see what I've done um, and, and do their own because everybody can be a philanthropist. And I think I've shown that by how easy and how a lot of times free it can be to do kind acts on a day-to-day -day basis. I think every single person can be a philanthropist. Evolutionarily speaking, and even nowadays, philanthropy and an altruistic outlook is absolutely essential within our communities. We simply cannot live on our own in the sense that we need each other. We need those positive interactions with other people. And that's why altruism philanthropy doesn't just have to mean, you know, going to feed orphans in a third world country. It can mean engaging in acts of kindness during the day. It can mean having the intention to be kind to every single person you meet that day. Given data that shows that one out of four Americans has no one to confide in, and that there is a very big loneliness epidemic in this country, that should be enough reason to show you that even just having the intention to be kind to the cash register woman or someone you meet on the street um, can have a huge impact on someone's life. You may be the first person that smiles at them that day. When I give back. When I give back. I feel good when I give back to others. I feel useful and needed. I feel like I'm fulfilling a sense of obligation. And knowing that I can make an impact on somebody's life is you know, one of the most important things for me. For me, giving back feels tremendously good. To just know that you're helping others and doing well by them, that means the world to me. I feel like it is as essential to being human as walking and breathing. So giving to others uh, uh, makes you feel happy. Scrooge wasn't very happy. Um, Santa Claus always is. <laughs> I tell people all the time that giving back to other people is a very selfish thing for me because it just makes me feel so good to know that I can help someone or that I've done something for someone else. When I give back, it makes me feel good that I am in a position to help others and to share. Uh, and, and I go to sleep uh, feeling really good about it. It makes you feel warm, uh, makes you feel, feel good. Helping people for me is an expression of my full self. Helping people for me uh, is an expression of my personal values. I just think everybody ought to try it because it makes you feel very good. What makes me get up in the morning with my feet on fire is the possibility of creating impact for others or my family. Do I like being called a philanthropist? Not really. I'd rather be called a businessman that cares deeply about impact for many people in many different economic situations. I measure my success on the impact on the individual's lives, where you're able to empower someone to economically emerge and thrive on their own. I was born in, uh, in Gross Point, which is a small town just outside of Detroit, uh, back in 1959. My brother and I had always wanted to go into business, and we kept dreaming up ideas, and you know, we'd sit in bed with the covers up around our chins talking about going into business. My brother went to business school here in Chicago at Northwestern University, where he got his MBA. Uh, so when Stan was getting his MBA, I was busy working at a mobile home manufacturing plant in, uh, in Polkton, North Carolina. And he and I decided that it was really time to get serious about starting a company together. So I moved up to Chicago and it was during that time that I was kind of a weekend mountain biker and my brother was a weekend triathlete. And that's when he first had the idea to put shifting on the handlebars of bikes. And that became the genesis of SRAM Corporation, and uh, it became our very first product back in 1987. SRAM Corporation designs 
components for some of the highest performing bikes in the world. But I think the most powerful bike I've ever seen is the bike in the hands of a mother trying to feed her daughter or in the hands of a schoolgirl fighting for her education. In December of 2004, the Indian Ocean tsunami hit and we began to see the impact of that disaster. We thought to ourselves that maybe we could raise money from all of our locations and uh, send it to uh, one of the relief organizations to help them. Uh, but then we thought that maybe there was something more impactful we could do. Maybe we could leverage our experience in the bicycle industry and create a greater impact by providing simple, sustainable transportation in the form of a bicycle. And that was the beginning of World Bicycle Relief. When FK came to me and said, let's start World Bicycle Relief, it was really amazing to me that he had a vision to actually do that. And the Indian Ocean tsunami occurred way on the other side of the world. And I couldn't even imagine figuring out how to help the folks that were affected by that. So it was, it was really amazing. And then to have the idea that we could use our expertise in the bicycle industry to help those people that had been you know, so, so tragically devastated was, was a novel idea. I, it never would have occurred to me. My wife, Leah, who's also a professional photographer, and I hopped on a plane and traveled to Indonesia to interview uh, communities and organizations and proposed doing a large-scale bike program. We met with people in uh, Jakarta area, and rubble was still on the ground, and people couldn't even comprehend a bicycle program because the roads were impassable. We were advised to go to Sri Lanka and see what we could learn there and that they were further along in terms of recovery. We found it to be true and people were jumping up and down. They wanted a bicycle, they were ready, they said bring them on. We had done a distribution for people that had been relocated 15 miles inland. We were in this makeshift village I saw this soccer game break out. And I was like, ooh, they're having a good time. What are they doing? Why all of a sudden the soccer game? Are they just so happy? And I realized that we had included pumps with the bicycles and they were able to pump up their ball now and they were like ready to play. Another disaster relief humanitarian was talking to us at one point and he said, you know, okay, this work you're doing here in Sri Lanka is really interesting. Um, those quarter of a million people that died from the Indian Ocean tsunami um, die every two weeks in Southern Africa from preventable diseases. And um, that's a hard statistic to swallow. You really can't go back to your normal job after you hear that. And that's what we decided to scale up in Africa. We went through a selection process and, and chose Zambia as our first place to scale it up. Uh, Zambia is a thousand miles from any major port, it's landlocked. The roads and infrastructure really don't exist, so the bikes take a pounding there. And we found that most of the bikes that we tested would fall apart after a couple of weeks. The main challenge with World Bicycle Relief is really one of distance. So the bike is the tool by which people move around, how a kid gets to school, how somebody takes their goods to market. And the challenge World Bicycle Relief were having was really one of how can the bike go further? How can we get people to market quicker? How can we go up hills? And we'd really reached the end of where conventional bicycle components could take us and we needed something new. We began studying all of the things that would break on a bike, and then we began improving them. And we worked with the suppliers there to come up with a bike that would last and last, and that we could rely on. We affectionately named it the Buffalo Bike, which was a strong and noble beast, 
and, uh, and could create uh, a lot of carrying capacity for individuals. This work in Africa is not disaster relief at its core, but it is an effort to alleviate poverty. We'll provide access to education, healthcare, economic development, and if it's an appropriate fit, disaster relief. In the world of healthcare, what a bike does is enables a caregiver to visit more clients at one time. For a student in a rural area who might have five, 10 kilometers that they have to walk every day to get to school and then to walk home, a bicycle cuts that time that they otherwise have to spend walking and allows them to spend that time doing other things like help around the house or to study or to arrive at school uh, fresher with more energy. For an entrepreneur, you know, transportation is an essential part of business. Uh, if you've got goods or services and you need to bring them to customers or clients and you don't have transportation, your range of customers or clients is small. But with a bicycle, you can increase that number and begin to uh, expand your business. All of our programs, uh, individuals either work to earn a bike, or they stay in school to receive a bike, or they can purchase a bike through microfinance. And we find that the results are, are much more positive. It gives them a sense of ownership, a sense of pride, and we see that the bikes are maintained much better. So we no longer just grant bikes to individuals. We set up programs that enable them to earn them. We're all part of a community, and our community can be um, here in Chicago, it can be America, it can be the world. I believe if one looked at some of the works that, um, that we do as philanthropic, I would look at it through a slightly different lens and say, no, we're simply being part of a larger community. A community that when you're strong, you help those that are weak, and when you're weak, you reach out for assistance to those people that are strong. Economists have often talked about altruism as a motivator for charitable behavior more broadly, but also self-interest. In other words, households give because they derive benefits from their charitable activities, whether those are formal benefits in terms of recognition, appreciation, status, social uh, acclaim, and so forth, but also um, intangible benefits. Uh, one of um, our colleagues, an economist at University of San Diego, talks about the warm glow that households receive from their charitable giving. In other words, we give because it also makes us feel good. That may be another sort of self-interested reason for giving, or what economists call a class of models called impure altruism. So it's not, you're not just giving to benefit others, but also because the act of giving improves our own lives. Being generous to others actually enhances our own well-being and our own welfare. I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. My family life was very colorful. Lots of parties, lots of different activities, and um, certainly very busy. I remember one time we were traveling in Italy and I saw my dad buy a young couple uh, a bottle of wine, just cause, and I, I thought that that was pretty cool. Philanthropy was integrated into our lives. I know that my parents were philanthropic people and they gave to various charities, but um, as I now understand it, philanthropy isn't necessarily exclusive to just uh, giving money. I am currently an IT recruiter. I work for uh, a very small private firm in downtown Chicago in The Loop. 
I have um, a great life. So giving back is such an important part of my adult life. I had this idea called Hump and Cup. The hump from Hump and Cup is really designed to be um, the day of the week, Wednesdays, when I look to the person either in front of me or behind me at a local coffee shop and offer to buy them some coffee. Here's my spiel. I say, hey, good morning. And I'll just say, you know what? I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee today. What are you having? Sometimes they're like, wow, that's great. And other times they're like, why? I was delighted when I got to meet Ellen. She's just so lively and she was so surprised. It was really nice to um, have the opportunity to kind of plant a little caffeine goodness on her. <laughs> Lauren, thank you very much. So <laughs> nice to meet you too. After I take the picture and I know what their order is and I know a little bit about them, I create a little content. I have a webmaster that I work with. She puts it up on uh, our social media channels. These little hump and cup opportunities, when I walk away, it's it's really, it's a great feeling. I, I more or less feel like I've done something, I've done something kind. I've done something that may have surprised somebody. I've done something that may have made their day. I've done something maybe to um, plant a seed that maybe they could do this too. It does warm me, it really does. It does make me feel like I am um, participating even in the smallest way to um, spread a little um, joy, happiness, love, you know, uh, just something, something generous that I can do. People often equate happiness with pleasure, the hedonic lifestyle. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, food, money, even achievement and awards, all of the material pleasures of life that give us a high. But that high is actually very short-lived. We make some money, a big bonus, and then are left craving for more. The same is true for fame, you name it. But there's another form of happiness, and that is uh, sometimes called eudaimonic happiness. And that is a form of happiness that comes from engaging in acts of altruism, of connection, of service, of a purpose that's greater than you. And what research shows is that if you engage in more of those kinds of activities, you are actually gonna have happiness that lasts. When we are engaging in acts of service, of altruism, of compassion, of philanthropy, we are literally feeling happier and seeing that at the neural level. I've always been somewhat lonely. I always felt like the outcast, the, the one that was different, set aside and different from everyone else. I'm transgender. I was born male, but I've always felt biologically female. I, I never felt comfortable doing what the guys did. Drugs were early in my life. Marijuana, alcohol were the beginning. I was in active addiction for 23 years. As an addict, you're knowing, you know, you always need something, you always want something, you always desire something. It's what they call king baby syndrome. Me, 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 me. My mom had went through a many year of my addiction, but I really think the bottom hit um, in 2008 when I told my mom, I said, mom, I said, uh, 
come on, I need you to take me somewhere. And she says, oh, I don't feel like being bothered with your crap. And I said, okay. I said, where do you want to go? And I said, mom, I want you to take me to treatment. And I remember the person, she says, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And it was sun shining like it is today. But I, I remember as soon as we got in the car, it started to pour down rain and it poured down until we pulled up at 120 North Sagamon. You look right here where it looks in the corner like it's a, a, a piece of notebook paper with two lines on the side. That was my room. That's where I slept for about a year and a half. I'm happy for you. Thank you. I'm Thank glad, you. It I'm has glad been, you're okay. I'm it, glad to see you. It has been and wonderful. Uh, the idle mind is the devil's workshop, and when you're not busy, your mind has a tendency to wander back until you, to your using state. So we, we try to engage the resident in various things so that they can keep their mind occupied on something positive. You did well. I did, I did well. You, you did, matter of fact, you did you exceptionally well. <laughs> When I was in Haymarket, I really needed to find something that was going to keep my mind off of my addiction. They had a lot of different programs for us to try. I was more or less ready to leave Haymarket until I tried the um, dog therapy, and dog therapy worked for me. <laughs> In dog therapy, we did basic commands, sit, stay, heal. We did track courses like uh, running through cones. Canine Therapy Corps is an animal assisted therapy organization. We provide therapy dogs to hospitals, rehabilitation facilities, special needs schools, and other social service organizations. We're doing goal-directed interactive therapy with patients and our dogs are an integral part of participants' treatment plans. At the time Cheyenne was in our program, I happened to be the program leader at Haymarket Center. My husband, Louie, handled our dog, Rue, in the program, and they were fortunate enough to be paired with Cheyenne. Rue, hey you. It's lots of fun being a volunteer for Canine Therapy Corps. Haymarket provides a good, fun way for Rue to get out his yayas and for me to meet new people and share Rue and have a good time. The program worked for me because it let me know that I needed responsibilities in order to maintain my sobriety. Just completing the program can, can be such a big deal for these participants. And then when you couple the fact that a lot of individuals in substance abuse recovery have alienated people in their lives, they have formed these really intimate bonds then with the volunteers and with the dogs, and, and those bonds enable the participants to focus on their own recovery. Meeting Rue changed my life for the better. It gave me some patience. It taught me that it wasn't all about me. It kind of pushed my King Baby Syndrome to the side. It showed me what I needed in order for me to be a happy, functioning person. I am so happy that someone took a little time out of their personal lives to give me, a recovering addict, a chance to be new again, to be whole again, and to find a way to come out of the situation in which I had put myself in. It's good to spend your time with other people and to to help other people out. It's a good thing overall. It's a, it benefits society, it benefits people individually, it makes the world a better place. Rue Cheyenne and Louie's story embodies the volunteer experience because it shows what one person's impact can be on another person's life. I've been clean almost five years, thank you God. I'm always grateful for all the people and everything that it took for me to become clean. Thanks, Louie. Thanks, Callie. Thanks, Hey Market. <laughs> Thank you. If 
I had, man, if I had all the money in the world. If I had all the money in the world? That's a, re that's a really great question. World domination through life of yesness. I would spend it in service to others. I would form a huge foundation and fund it with 90% of what I had, and the last 10% I would save for myself and riotous living. If I had all the money in the world, I'd retire. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is a, is a tough one because I was always raised by my father that money isn't everything. <sighs> what would I do? There's so much to be done, right? If I had all the money in the world, it would be used to educate people so that they could be able to take care of themselves. I would try to, you know, um, reduce or, or remove poverty. I would invest it in education of children with disabilities. I would use it to help people realize and recognize their full potential. I would create an entity similar to Bill and Melinda Gates. I mean, what they've done is unbelievable and they're changing the future of the world. I'd have a lot of fun giving it away. I think it's incredibly important to think when you're giving something, it has to be free of judgment and will or else you're not really giving it away. Philanthropy is giving to others and not expecting anything else besides happiness and joy. I was uh, born in Wisconsin. I came to Chicago when I was around seven. When I moved to Chicago, my elementary school was Lara Academy and my homeroom teacher is Ms. Ramos. She's the type of person that is caring and willing to help out no matter what. She put a lot of cash out of her pocket into us in order for us to feel happy and at home in her classroom. Ms. Ramos's family is kind of in a struggle with money and stuff like that. If I was given the opportunity to help Ms. Ramos, I'd try to just make her feel happy and make her feel like she's the best person. There's a lot of great ways that teens can give back, but I think uh, no teen, regardless of where they live, what school they go to, what neighborhood they grow up in, see themselves as being capable to, you know, financially impact a person in need. So there is this anonymous family here in Chicago that was looking for a really unique way to give teens the experience of what it feels like to give and to give big. We put our heads together and came up with this idea of what if we gave them the gift of $1,000? And the challenge to them was, who is a person in need that you would want to give it to? We realized that the name Ving was in a lot of amazing words, like giving, receiving, believing, thriving, moving, achieving, all of these words that seem to inspire the project itself. And so, um, thus Ving was born, the Ving Project. Hi, I'm Megan, I'm 17 years old. And I'm Gabby and I'm 16 years old. And my name is Spencer, I'm 15 years old. I nominate. The person I want to Ving is Walter. The person I want to Ving is Alejandra Villegas. Teens apply to the program by making a 60-second selfie-style video to tell us who in their life deserves a $1,000 boost. The person I want to nominate is my fourth grade homeroom teacher named Deborah Ramos. I wanted to nominate Ms. Ramos for Ving because I really believe she, she deserves the $1,000 because she spent so much money on other people that it's finally her time. I got a text to check my email because there was a surprise on it. I checked it and then I saw Ving and uh, I was starting to get shaky because I thought I might have lost. And when I checked it, it said congratulations. I won. I think what will be fun is to watch Dominic realize that true happiness really comes from giving and I don't know if he knows what he's in for. Ms. Ramos and her family still know nothing about the Ving. It's all just one big surprise for everybody. All right, go for it. Hey, my name is Megan. 
name is Dominic. Uh, it's just, it's Tuesday, and uh, I'm about to give someone $1,000. Yay! <laughs> there she is. Oh, really? Yeah. What's going on? Where are we going? Right here. Um, so, uh, I have something for you. And, uh, I had this uh, opportunity to uh, nominate a person that I think really, uh, like, really deserves it. And uh, I picked you to get nominated for the $1,000, and uh, I won. What was the wink? What did, so, oh my uh, God, Dominic, that's awesome. You really inspire me because you've given so much back to me in fourth grade and through fourth through eighth and even now in high school. And uh, I really believe that you should spend this money on yourself <laughs> and really enjoy yourself with a thousand dollars. This means so much. You make me feel so special right now. You actually see something happen when the team does deliver the check and you know that that's a moment that is always gonna stay with them and is never going to leave them. And from now on, they see themselves as a giver. My heart feels uh, just full now, knowing that I helped out a teacher that I felt was in need. The Ving experience taught me to just give to others and don't expect anything else. Just make yourself feel happy and make others happy too. Oh, this is great. One, two, three. These days, I think it's mandatory to teach kids how to give back. I think it's important to teach young people to give back because I really think that's how communities thrive. I feel that everything is surrounded around children so that they feel good about themselves. We need to teach them how to get out of themselves. I think it's really important to teach them the benefits of giving to others. If the next generation doesn't give back, then the world's not going to move forward. I think it's very important for young people to be taught about philanthropy because they're the younger generations that eventually everybody is going to look up to. We need to be teaching young people that you don't just take, take, take. It's time to break the cycle of kids thinking that, oh, it's all about me, me, me. For them to see that in their own community they can indeed give back and share something of themselves and see what it feels like to both give and receive, I think is really incredible. You will be faced at a point in your life where you're going to need help. And if you help others, you are certainly going to encounter somebody that's going to help you. We often wonder how important is it that we teach children and young adults the importance of compassion and altruism. Well, on the one hand, it is very important. On the other hand, we've got to remember that it's also very natural and instinctual for them to be compassionate. Research shows that um, little children will go out of their way to try and help someone who needs their help. So we're not teaching them any new skills, we're just reminding them of something that they already know, that they already would do naturally. Back in December 2014, I started thinking about prom. and every other senior girl in my school was also thinking about prom. I started collecting money for prom, just doing odd jobs on Craigslist, but after I had gotten about $200, which could pay for a ticket and a little bit of a dress, I figured why was I going through all of this to spend money on just me for just one night? It didn't make any sense. So that's when I started my plan to ditch my prom to help the homeless instead. Growing up, when we would go downtown and we would see homeless people, my brother and I were always told to ignore them or not make eye contact with them. It wasn't until I was older did I figure out that ignoring homeless people and just stepping over them was very dehumanizing, so it was around my, my teenage years that I figured that I can make a difference. I mean, it just takes one person and one idea.
It is Saturday, March 28th, 2.30 p.m., and we're at Costco to do a little shopping. After I had collected all the money that I was planning to use for prom and decided to put it towards the homeless, my dad and I set off to Costco and Walmart and bought some things to put in boxes. Combs, toothbrushes, we included food, socks and shirts, gum and chapstick and band-aids. I decided to document my experience not only so I could look back on it in a few years and show my children and be proud of what I did, but I also wanted to inspire people the way people inspired me when I watched YouTube videos of other people helping the homeless. It's 4.08 p.m. on April 26th, the day after prom, and we're headed into Chicago. The day after prom, my dad and I set off for Chicago. We approached people in Lower Wacker, on State Street, and everyone was very warm and um, very kind and thankful, and everyone just had a smile on their face. I didn't expect to cry during my distribution, but um, we approached a woman with two children, and I gave a box to each one of them. And I got back in the car and I said to my dad, I couldn't believe how blessed we were. And I just cried and yeah. As my dad and I were driving out of Chicago, we saw about five or 10 more people on State Street that we couldn't help because we had run out of boxes. And that really broke my heart. So I knew from then I wanted to do it again, but I didn't know how I would get the funds to do so. My friend encouraged me to start a GoFundMe site, which is a crowdfunding source that allows people to post about the things they want to raise money for, and people all over the internet can contribute to their cause. On the night after the distribution, I just put the video all together and put it up on YouTube. I didn't think the video would explode like it did. Ashton Kutcher posted it on his Facebook, and Nicki Minaj posted it on her Facebook, and donations just blew up from there. My co-founder, his name is Nick Katsiantos, and he was really the one that encouraged me to turn this all into a nonprofit. He saw how much the GoFundMe was raising, and he thought that I could make everything official. Our nonprofit is called Give a Box, and we decided on that name because it's so simple, and that's really the message we want to convey, is that giving is simple. On Sunday, August 9th, 2015, we did our first official distribution as a nonprofit, as Give a Box. So we had about 25 volunteers all packed into my house and we packed up 100 boxes. We had each person write about four or five handwritten notes of encouragement. I really felt like that was a special touch. loaded up four cars and we headed into Chicago. Giving just gives you such a rush when you have this altruistic attitude and you approach your life with the intent to help other people. It makes your life more fulfilling and when you're making other people happy, you become happier. It's natural and it's what happens when you give back to your community or you help someone in a situation where they need help. Yeah, I'm a philanthropist. I do consider myself a philanthropist. I do, because I not only give money away, I raise it. I'm clear uh, that my life's purpose and my work is really to do mission-based work, uh, and I, I want to help people. I do consider myself a philanthropist. I believe most people in the world, whether or not how they, um, they define it, can consider themselves a philanthropist. If you look at the just the general meaning of what philanthropy is, is uh, is love for humanity. Um, I think I fit into that. 
I do consider myself a philanthropist, especially now that I've demystified that term for myself. I mean, in some ways, until these questions uh, and, and this conversation, I haven't reconsidered the multiple meanings maybe that philanthropy can have. I give money um, on an annual basis to different organizations. I give them my time quite a bit. So I guess I do consider myself a philanthropist, even though I'm not wealthy. You know, I consider everyone a philanthropist. I consider myself a philanthropist. I do now, now that I realize that um, being a philanthropist is not just about giving money. If the definition is someone who cares and gives back, then yes, I am a philanthropist. I definitely have come to see myself and very excited to see myself as a philanthropist. There's scales of philanthropy, of course. Um, but I don't try to necessarily measure myself against others. I, I just try to do all that I can. I'm motivated to give because I enjoy being happy. And the broad concept of philanthropy, yes, but specifically in giving a lot of money away, no, because I don't have it to give. While I might not be the person who is writing the very, very large checks, which is amazing, and we need people to do that as much as we need people to do the on-the-ground work, I think everyone has a place and everyone can be a philanthropist in this city. Overall, philanthropy is growing, not just in the U.S., but around uh, the world where there's a growing interest in the role that the nonprofit sector can play in solving problems. In the best of all possible worlds, we might not need philanthropy because needs would be addressed um, you know, by, by government, uh, for example. There are some things that government can do better than, uh, than philanthropy, realistically within communities, uh, there is always going to be a shortfall. And in the context of that shortfall, philanthropy can make a real difference. On some level, the premise of government is to also help the people that they serve. I, I think that um, certainly we've seen plenty of examples of that going completely awry. So if one individual at a time is helping the people around them, I think that's the core of improving our communities, improving our countries, improving our world. Technology has the potential to really change philanthropy. Right now, um, I think we haven't fully realized that potential. If we think about online giving, it's still a relatively small slice of the overall pie. So less than 10% of all giving is uh, mediated through online channels. Technology is changing the world every day. The distribution of, of information is where I see uh, the impact of technology and philanthropy the most. We're at a point in human history where the entire human race is as advanced and as privileged as we've ever been. From global life expectancy to eradication of diseases to eradication of famine. And at the same time, um, there are huge disparities uh, even within our own community. As humans, we have an obligation to help other humans and it's at the root of our existence. We're defined by the acts that we do in our life, and I think that that moment when we're about to leave, when we're about to die, uh, is that reflection of, did I do enough? So I guess it's a matter of what choices we make in what we do, and how that then creates that world that we want to live in, or our kids to live in. So what we do matters, I think matters a, a great deal. Absolutely it matters. I mean, it, it, it matters to you, the person who is doing the giving. It matters to the person you are giving to. Uh, it matters to your community. It matters to society. Across the country, there are movements, uh, there are sectors, there's education happening in so many different ways to bring philanthropy to life, to bring it down to everyone's level. Just remember that your generosity is what really matters. It matters to you and it matters to everybody else. Your contribution matters. Your dreams matter. Your actions matter. Your love matters. Your kindness. Your time. Your commitment matters. You matter. What do you do? What you do. What you do matters.
Funding for What You Do Matters has been made possible by the Chicago Community Trust. Our future lies in our commitment to each other and practicing goodwill toward all people. At the Chicago Community Trust, we have the privilege to witness the power of kindness and generosity every day. The stories you've just seen reaffirm our faith in the pure and genuine spirit that is Chicago. Together, we can make our region even stronger, safer, and better because what you do matters.